Okay, today is May 15, 2023, and we have a very special guest back on the show, Dr. Yolandra Hancock. Dr. Hancock is a graduate of UCLA Medical School and John Hopkins School of Public Health. Dr. Hancock is a public health expert with a focus on health disparities, a professor at the Milken Institute School of Public Health at George Washington University, and a board certified pediatrician and obesity medicine specialist. Dr. Hancock is also the medical director of CRC Health and Wellness Group and the founder of Delta Health and Wellness Consulting. Dr. Hancock is a tireless advocate for public health reform, education, and fighting childhood obesity. Dr. Hancock is also a sought-after health and wellness expert, appearing on national talk shows such as CNN, NBC, TEDx, Black News Channel, and is a frequent guest of one of my favorite radio shows, The Critical Hour on Sputnik Radio. Dr. Hancock, thank you for coming on the show and welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me. Well, I wanted to talk to you about Black Maternal Health. Um, last month, um, we celebrated Black Maternal Health Week, which lasted from April 11th to April 17th. Um, and before I jump into my question, I wanted to note that in late February of this year, um, the UN published, published a terrifying report that found that women are dying um, in greater numbers today than they were in pregnancy and in childbirth than they were um, in, 20, in 2000. Um, and, um, and, and I think the numbers in the US um, are, are also staggering, um, but what are, um, the major issues fam uh, facing Black women, uh, families, and the community in terms of Black maternal health. It's interesting, the statistics that you just read out, especially when you look at what happened in 2021, um, maternal mortality increased by about 40%. The numbers now are comparable to what they were back in the 1960s. And it's unfathomable to imagine that birth outcomes are the same as they were like 50, 60 years ago, it's it's just unbelievable until you start looking at what we call the social determinants of health. And we've talked about this before, the factors where birthing parents live, work, pray, play, all of those things where they age, your zip code is what really defines your access to healthy food, your access to physical activity, your access to equitable health care. Often in maternal health conversations, we focus our attention on the individual. Uh, we hear a lot about black women's health and how they come into pregnancy sicker. Well, I will tell you that I was at my peak health before I got pregnant and almost lost my life uh, just a couple of days after having my daughter. I taught Zumba until I was six months pregnant and I, I ate the cleanest I ever have. But what I will tell you is that there are factors like structural racism that come into play. There are issues of access to, as I mentioned before, the choices that we make in terms of what we eat and how we spend our time, it's really defined on our zip code. So if a black woman is more likely to develop diabetes, high blood pressure, et cetera, et cetera, we have to think about it in the context in which she's making health decisions. And it's no more apparent in terms of the challenges that black women face specifically than with maternal mortality. Black women are almost four times as likely to die in having a baby than their white counterparts. And this is regardless of socioeconomic status, educational status, et cetera. This isn't black poor women dying to have babies. It's well-educated black women dying to have babies. And we have to shift from black women simply trying to survive pregnancy to thriving in pregnancy. Yeah, thank you for pointing out that it isn't just a class issue, um, that the historical and structural racism are bigger factors. Um, and in speaking of which, and in, in I think it was last September, um, the critically important documentary Birthing Justice was released, mm -hmm. um, which calls to attention the maternal health crisis in the US and the fact that it disproportionately impacts black women. You were um, in this documentary. Why did you think it was important to be a part of this documentary? For a couple of reasons, I wanted to participate in the Birthing Justice documentary. One, I loved how they frame maternal health, particularly Black maternal health in this documentary. It isn't just that Black women are dying disproportionately. It also brings joy back into the birthing experience. It's very specific in terms of how we find solutions. A lot of stories are told that really make it sound abysmal that if you are Black, 
and a female and get pregnant, that, you, that you're likely to die. My daughter, before birthing justice came out, she actually said, mommy, I don't know if I ever want to have kids because I don't want to die. And I'm like, even now it, it, it weighs on my chest that at such a young age, she's aware. Birthing justice helps to pivot the conversation to really allow us all collectively to see what the solutions are, uh, both in the healthcare space, but also in just societal, uh, the societal view about pregnant people, particularly black pregnant persons. I had not previously publicly talked about my own birthing experience. And to be honest with you, Ryan, the first time I watched my birthing video after having recorded it during the time that my daughter was born was preparing for uh, my participation in the birthing justice um, documentary because it was such a mixed emotion that I felt the joy of having my daughter, but also the pain and the fear that was associated with um, me nearly losing my life to postpartum um, hypertension. I had a hypertensive crisis a day or so after my daughter was born. And I wanted people to see that if a physician could experience something so significant, something so drastic, and then facilitate some change. I became a doula as a result of my own birthing experience and also the loss of life of other um, Black women who I related to that were also physicians and ended up losing their lives during pregnancy. I felt like it was necessary to use my story to really negotiate and navigate change in the system, both in how healthcare providers are trained in interacting with Black pregnant people, but also across the country in terms of societal change. One of the big reasons why I think I dealt with a lot of stress when I was pregnant was my work environment was harsh. I was expected to work at what we call 150% FTE, so that's like a job and a half. I was seeing general pediatric patients, obesity medicine patients. I was helping the Obesity Institute to function. I was giving talks. I was teaching at GW. I was helping to uh, run an obesity intervention program in Southeast. It was a lot on me. And when I actually vocalized that it was too much, I was told that pregnancy was not an excuse. Everyone is expected to work harder and that you just need to suck it up. This was one more, one month before I had my daughter. And I just think my body had had enough. Uh, by the time I had her, it's like, I, sis, I carried you this far. I don't have any more to give. And that's what ended up happening with me. And because of those circumstances, I felt it necessary to use my voice so that one, other people knew that they were not alone. I did feel isolated. I felt lonely in pregnancy and going through the things that I did because no one ever talks about the challenges of pregnancy. You're expected to just glow on the, on Instagram, right? Everybody's glowing and popping and healthy and their bodies are just their bellies. That wasn't my experience, but because I didn't hear from anyone else who had a different experience, I thought it was just me. I also didn't meet my own expectations as a pediatrician and someone with a master's in public health and maternal and child health. Like I just knew I would be able to do it better. That again, I was internalizing my own maternal issues just like everyone else does when they look outwardly in terms of what's happening with black maternal health. By being transparent and authentic, I hope people will appreciate that. It allows others to know that they are not alone, but it also allows officials to know bosses. My boss actually texted me when he saw the documentary and he said, sis, I had no idea you were going through so much. And part of my challenge, <clears throat> excuse me, was how I was treated. There was no space for me not to be okay. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And I recommend the documentary to everyone. It's very powerful, it's very moving, and it's, it's incredibly important that more and more people in the public realize how um, serious of a problem this is. Mm -hmm. um, and considering all the deeply troubling data some of which we discussed to black maternal health, particularly in the context of historical and ongoing structural racism that exists in our society. Do you have thoughts about um, home births? Um, can they be safer than in hospital births, particularly for black women or any, any thoughts generally around that? Yeah, I, I definitely think that home births are a safe option. I think that there should be partnership so that there's a backup plan. We can't talk about African-American women being at higher risk for poor birthing outcomes without creating a system that covers them from home birth all the way through if they need to go to the hospital. There are excellent examples. One of them is demonstrated in Birthing Justice. Community of Hope is a fantastic demonstration of how this can be done at um, Drew, King Drew Hospital in Los Angeles, another perfect example of this kind of partnership. But throughout the film, it demonstrates how home birth 
assisted birth with doulas and mid and midwives can be a very healthy alternative. But as a physician, I feel like you definitely need to have better partnerships. As a doula, I've seen both sides of of the relationship, right? I've seen physicians who roll their eyes at doulas and don't want them in the space. I've also seen doulas who are very antagonistic towards healthcare professionals. And this is a team effort. Everyone should be team mommy, daddy, baby, whoever the parental units are in order to have a healthy outcome. And when we're able to create that form of partnership, that's when you have the best outcomes. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. And the, um, of course, addressing the issues you've outlined require radical, if not revolutionary change. Um, but what are some of the more immediate or um, intermediary ways that our audience can support uh, the Black maternal health movement? That's an excellent question. The first thing I would say is to call your congressperson. They just re reintroduced the Black maternal health momnibus today. What that means is uh, support services, so reimbursement for doula and mid midwifery services. It allows for expanded paid leave so that birthing parents can actually stay at home and take care of their babies and hopefully successfully breastfeed and also heal in that postpartum period. There's this misconception that pregnancy ends the minute the baby passes through the birth canal. That's not the case at all. It's the first 12 months of life for the baby and the first 12 months in that postpartum period. And what the Momnibus does is it allows for provisions for paid leave. It allows for provisions for better education. So for healthcare provider training, right? So there um, we hear stories over and over again of black women showing up, even Serena Williams knowing her symptoms, having had a PE before and still not being taken seriously. So if Serena Williams isn't being listened to, what's the likelihood of like Jackie from around the way in Southeast DC being listened to by healthcare professionals? So that would be the first thing is support the federal legislation that expands and strengthens maternal health services. The second is look at what's happening locally. If there are any uh, states that are passing similar legislation, I believe Connecticut, and one other state as of this week have considered strongly introducing some form of momnibus legislation. I know California has. Make sure that if you are local and are aware, do what you need to do. And then from a personal standpoint, don't wait for a pregnant person to ask for help. If someone had asked me for help, asked me truly how I was doing and not just in passing, I would have shared what was going on with me and I would have been able to uh, release a lot of that pent up frustration, hurt, just stress that likely facilitated um, my hypertensive crisis. It's when you're at work, how are you considering a pregnant person? Is it a nuisance? Is it an inconvenience for you? Or are you creating space for this person to be pregnant and healthy and then come back into the work environment in a safe, supportive way? Each of us has a role to play in the maternal health crisis in this country. And that's exactly what I expect everyone to do is show up for pregnant people, particularly black pregnant people. Thank you for outlining that. Those are all the questions I have for you today. Um, is there anything you wanted to add or discuss before we close? What I would say is certainly make sure you catch the birthing justice documentary, share it with friends, start having conversations. Even if you are not pregnant, you've never been pregnant, you know someone who's pregnant, it's important for us to continue this conversation so that our birth outcomes improve. It's a shame that we have the same birth outcomes that we did back in the 60s. We've had certainly more advanced um, medical um, skill, more advanced technology. It shouldn't be that way. We shouldn't rank between the Czech Republic and Costa Rica in this country. We shouldn't be higher, 10 times higher in terms of maternal mortality compared to other developed nations. The statistic was just released today that the United States leads the globe in terms of developed countries as it relates to maternal mortality. And that is not a distinction that we should be proud of. Mm, I couldn't agree more with that. Um, and again, thank you so much for coming on the show and I hope to have you back again soon. Thank you so much for having me.